wanted to kick off our, our Earth Day celebration with a, a bunch of different events because, you know, uh, as we believe at BINS, every day is Earth Day. We should be conscious of our impact on the environment all of the time, but we especially like to, to celebrate it and talk about the various different aspects of human impact on the world uh, during this lovely uh, uh, transition into springtime. So my name is Anna. I'm the director of Wildlife Ambassador Programs here at VINS. And have you guys been to visit us before? You guys know, you guys welcome back. Um, our mission is to motivate people to care about the environment. And we do that in a whole bunch of different ways through our education, our research, and our wildlife rehabilitation are the main ways. So we do a lot of these programs uh, on site, mostly featuring our live animal ambassadors. We also do, um, here, well, yep. We also do um, a bunch of different programs uh, with field trips. Uh, we host summer camps during the summertime. We are in more than 30 schools around the Upper Valley, helping to enhance their STEM education offerings, all with the idea that we believe the more you know about the environment around you, the more likely you are to care. And the better prepared each of us is to make little changes in the way we live our lives that have huge impacts on the natural world. We also partner with scientists from around the Northeast, looking at our local populations of American kestrels and broadwing hawks, flying squirrels and snapping turtles. And we run uh, probably the largest uh, rehabilitation hospital in the Northeast that sees more than a thousand wild bird patients every year, uh, including hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of baby birds soon to be arriving at our doorstep throughout the summertime with the goal to rehabilitate and release those birds back into the wild as soon as they're able to go. Uh, and all of this, of course, is centered in this idea of conservation. We want people to be uh, actively involved in the stewardship of their environment, to feel confident that they are you know, literate enough to understand the workings of the environment around us. Uh, and we are always conscious of the different crises that our planet is facing uh, today. And climate change being kind of the big overbearing one that we're all constantly worried about. Um, so uh, our executive director, Charlie Radigan, and I thought that it would be a good idea to talk specifically about climate change and its effect on birds, because that's the big focus of our work here at VINS is birds. And birds represent a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And we'll talk about why do we care specifically about birds uh, as we go through this program today. And since we are a small group, if you have any questions as we go along, please don't hesitate to ask. So we're going to start by uh, going through a little check-in. Where are we with respect to climate change today in 2024? What's going on in the world around us? We're going to talk about why should we care about birds with respect to climate change? Uh, and look at climate change from a bird's perspective. We're trapped in our, our human minds a lot of the time, but we here at VINS, especially those of us that work directly with the animal ambassadors, know that there's a whole millions and millions of other perspectives out there on what this is doing to uh, the daily life of a bird. And then, of course, where do we go from here? How do we take this knowledge forward? So to check in right now, on temperature, right? Climate change, we now use those words to refer to it because uh, global warming is a little bit misleading. Sometimes uh, places on our planet are actually getting colder, they're actually getting wetter, they're actually getting drier. Um, but temperature is one of these big things to take into account. So the average temperature of our planet, that's across the board, across the year, has increased by a little more than one degree Celsius uh, since 1880, so in just 144 years. And two thirds of that warming, that one degree Celsius warming has actually occurred since 1975. So only in the past uh, nearly 50 years now. And so uh, the cycles we're familiar with, the Earth goes through uh, amazing tumultuous cycles in its climate uh, throughout time. So uh, as we move out of ice ages and into ice ages over the past uh, several million years, we know that the global temperature has varied anywhere from uh, four to seven degrees Celsius uh, in, the, in the course of 5,000 years. So that, that three, three degrees of difference in temperature, that occurs generally over a 5,000 year period in time. But in our past 100 years, the temperature has climbed that two thirds of a degree Celsius, roughly 10 times faster than that ice age recovery warming that we typically see in the natural cycles of our planet. And so that graph that just appeared up there is what's referred to as the hockey stick. 
So it's showing you the different average temperature of the globe since the year 500, right? And we see there's a lot of up and downs and a lot of up and downs and a lot of up and downs. And then uh, my, my face is blocking the <laughs> most of the hockey stick, but you can see that line that goes straight up off the edge of the graph. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about the rate of global warming. Yes, we're warming and yes, we have done so in the past, but it's just on an order of magnitude, several orders of magnitude faster than it's ever been happening before. And we can also compare that. What happened? Oh no, my batteries have died. No. Aha, thank you, Sarah. Also compare that to, uh, so that's the top graph is just the last 500 years. This is the last 800,000 years. So nearly a million years of temperature change in history. And, and here we are, and here's the, the hockey stick would fit right into the end of that, that graph down there. So Earth is no stranger to climate changing. What we're talking about is the scale of it. So also not the not only thing that we're concerned about is temperature, we're also concerned about carbon dioxide because we know this to be the reason for the temperature change that's occurring on our planet is the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So this one is carbon dioxide from ice core analyses uh, that are done in places like the far uh, northern uh, the North Pole and the Arctic Circle area and in Antarctica as well. Uh, and it shows us that over the last 800,000 years or so, um, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is never really more than this line, which is 300 parts per million. Uh, and during these, these cycles, yes, never higher than 300 parts per million. But when VINS was founded 52 years ago now, 1972, carbon dioxide levels were over that. We we're already at 325. And this was when conversations about climate change were getting started. In 2013, global levels of carbon dioxide surpassed 400 parts per million for the first time, so far as we can tell, in Earth's history. In 2023, uh, in March, uh, was, which is the most recent, like, fully analyzed data that I could find, global levels were at 421 parts per million. So they're going up and they're going up fast. So what's being done? The UN is one of the leading global organizations that um, has taken on bringing different countries together to talk about uh, what, we, what we can and should be doing to combat climate change. Uh, COP28, the different COP conferences, uh, was held uh, just recently in the UAE, and the world leaders that met there reaffirmed the promise that governments had made to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius beyond pre-industrial levels. So as I mentioned, we're just above one degree and we're trying to limit it to one and a half degrees. So really, really against the clock with these promises that we've made to the rest of the world. Uh, this agreement, uh, which was originally forged in the Paris Agreements, uh, has some stipulations to it. In order for us to achieve this goal of limiting any further warming to 1.5 degrees C, um, we have to move away from fossil fuels. We have to move away from coal power. Um, we have to halt and reverse deforestation. We have to reduce uh, methane emissions, and we have to switch to electric vehicles, those being some of the most um, uh, prevalent reasons for carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. So that's kind of where we are. But why, why birds? This is all very, very human focused stuff right now. How does, this, how does this affect birds and why do we care specifically about birds and climate change? Well, it's a big focus of what we do here at Vince. In the summertime and throughout the year, we're doing education programs for uh, hundreds and hundreds of school groups that come from across Vermont and New Hampshire to visit us to learn about our native wildlife species. And we know as we, we see the years go by, all of the different kind of changes that we can expect in the way that the trees are blooming out and the timing of the leaves falling and how much flooding we experience in July every year now. Um, this is something that's at our doorstep already. We uh, like to teach with animal ambassadors specifically because they have such a charismatic um, presence. Everyone wants to be up close and personal with an owl and it's an easy bridge to get people talking about uh, larger issues if they also affect this animal that we care for. 
We uh, love also doing kind of more one-on-one -on -one personal encounters with folks. It's not just a, a group of hundreds of people. Sometimes it's just six of us in a room together, having a conversation. These are all things that, that help us to better understand climate change. And we can reach people nowadays around the world. We started uh, pretty seriously during COVID times, as everyone did, doing education uh, digitally via Zoom, and we can continue to do that as well to reach uh, larger and larger audiences. Um, this is, I was just chatting earlier about some of the large audiences that we've been able to reach. Um, this is a program that we did at the Hopkins Center a number of years ago, and it's just a really um, easy connection, I think, for people to make because birds are so wonderful to be able to watch in flight as they behave. They're accessible to a lot of people. You just look outside and there's a bird right there. So we love being able to make that, that connection for folks. But what roles do birds play in our ecosystems? So they have a lot of different things that they do out there in the environment in the absence of us. And sometimes we'd refer to these things that they do as ecosystem services. These are things that birds do that we require in order to live a healthy life here on the planet Earth that we would otherwise have to build infrastructure and put money towards and pay for. Things like nutrient cycling, right? A little waxwing that eats a berry that then flies over here and poops out the berry, plants a new tree, right? That's a tree that we didn't have to plant. The uh, colony of gannets um, that you can see right here, they are also contributing to the cycle of nutrients by pooping, uh, by creating this incredibly, incredibly nitrogen-rich resource that just piles up on these otherwise barren, rocky islands um, that historically people have harvested that guano, that bird poop, in order to add nitrogen to farm fields to produce more uh, vegetables, to produce more food. So that's bringing nutrients out of the ocean that these birds are hunting fish back into the landscape where they're used to produce food crops. We also see birds responsible for balancing different populations as a predatory species, as many of them are, like our red-tailed hawk there, a little chipmunk, were it not for these birds with incredibly efficient uh, hunting adaptations and incredibly fast metabolisms, we would be absolutely overrun with the smaller prey species that are around. So they contribute to biodiversity by keeping a check on overpopulation of those animals. And a similar thing can be said for just a bird like a shorebird that's eating snails and mussels out of the, uh, the ocean sand. One thing that this particular uh, species of sandpiper has been observed doing is actually eating invasive snails. So snails that have been brought by humans to a place where they are not native and have begun to eat away at the biodiversity of other animals, these sandpipers are there keeping that biodiversity up by um, reducing the population of the invasive snails. So that's another important thing that they do. Birds are even pollinators. A lot of the time we think about insects as pollinators and insects are probably responsible for the greater majority of pollination, at least for our food crops. But birds like hummingbirds are also pollinators that spread um, plant genetics around. And my favorite one to talk about because vultures are some of my favorite animals is disease control. Vultures and other scavenging birds, when they consume a carcass, they are removing all of that meat, all of the gut viscera, all of the gross bacteria and viruses that could otherwise be allowed to breed within the environment. Uh, feral dogs and rats are not capable of sterilizing a carcass the same way that a flock of vultures is. They're called a committee, by the way. A group of vultures is a committee. Yes, uh, they, their stomach acid is so acidic that it actually can break down uh, things like the rabies virus, cholera, anthrax. They can survive eating something that's chock full of anthrax and ensure that it doesn't get out into the rest of the environment. So that's incredibly, incredibly important for us. Um, but don't forget, it's not just vultures. A lot of animals depend on carcasses, including uh, chickadees in the wintertime have been observed using the fat off of animal carcasses to feed themselves. So birds are very important cyclers uh, of these sorts of things. And I also wanted to add that we don't know everything at all about what birds do and, and w what ways we rely on them. This is a beautiful piece of artwork by an Anishinaabe artist uh, named Norval Morisot. 
Uh, it's called Bird Speaks to These Children. And I just thought it was a beautiful way to encapsulate this idea that we have a lot yet to learn about the ways that birds affect us, about the ways that we're linked to ecosystems. And if we start to lose these connections, we're going to lose that knowledge and we're going to not even be aware of the things that we're missing out on. So continuing to listen and have uh, scientific studies that surround these things and also to talk to native people who work closely alongside the environment and have different understandings of how things are connected uh, is, is very necessary as we move into a brand new climate. So why, do we, why are we talking about birds right now? Uh, a couple of years ago, this is a study that was done in 2019, looking at the different populations of birds across North America. So a big, big review study, many, many scientists, I think there's 300 scientists on this paper um, who are looking at how populations of birds have changed in North America since 1970. And they discovered, uh, much to their shock, they were not expecting this result that about 2.9 billion birds have been lost from the population uh, over that span of time. So that means not that 3 billion birds died over that course of 50 years, it means that there should be another 3 billion birds in our environment today that are not here. And we don't really know why. There are many hypotheses, of course, and people constantly working on these things, but one of the major um, uh, thoughts, of course, is how are these birds being affected by climate change uh, and by the implications of that changing ecosystem and not being able to adapt quickly enough because it's happening on such a fast rate. Um, so it's called the Three Billion Bird Study, if you've ever uh, heard it referenced that way, but it's a, a pretty landmark uh, study that showed us that, yes, over the last 50 or more years, this catastrophic decline in even some of our most common bird species um, is going on and is not likely to stop unless anything, unless something changes. So what does climate change look like? Yeah, yeah. Is that pretty even across all bird types? Or it's a good question. You know, it's, it's not. They, they showed that specifically uh, grassland birds and wetland birds were most affected by this, uh, and that ironically raptors were doing okay. And, and that gives me a lot of hope because I think the only reason why birds of prey were seen to not be in a cataclysmic decline is because they had been in that decline prior to 1970. And in 1970 was when people kind of realized like, oh yeah, the bald eagle's going to go extinct and that's going to be really embarrassing unless we do something about it. And so there was a lot, a lot of education and conservation focused specifically on that group of, of animals that they actually show a pretty even um, uh, stable population. But the problem is we, we didn't put in that level of energy for those grassland birds either. Yeah. Is this pollution of the water and then just pesticides? Mm -hmm. the land is why those two populations are dwindling? Yes, so right, and, and uh, habitat loss as well. Grasslands are one of the fastest declining habitats due to um, uh, industry and, and uh, habitat loss, people just moving into that area. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so let's look at these things from, from a bird's eye view, from a bird's perspective. We're going to look uh, kind of at a bunch of different things, uh, specifically from three different species, but just overall, um, there's several factors that we know kind of obviously are going to be happening to bird populations in general. Rising sea levels are going to cause problems for birds that nest along coastlines um, that already depend on the tides and things like that, only rising to a certain level. Um, migration pattern changing for birds that migrate uh, at a certain time of year when there's a certain temperature in the air or amount of prey available, amount of food available, they might change their timing of migration and we'll see a good example of that. They might alter their distribution in the landscape so it may, might be just showing up in places where they've never shown up before. Um, and uh, also nesting timing uh, shift. The nesting season might shift to a different time of year when those birds think, oh, well, it's warm enough right now. I'm going to have a clutch of eggs. And then there's not enough food available yet because the, there's a mismatch between the food availability and the, and the temperature out there. 
And it's the same thing for any bird that's dependent on other animals for food or fruits or seeds or nuts or something that something like that. And then also we, we see some displacement due to extreme weather events. Uh, and this has always happened, like the stellar sea eagle, if you guys heard about this giant Russian eagle has been hanging out in Nova Scotia and Maine for the past couple of years. We don't know how she got there. She probably flew over the North Pole, to be honest, but it might have been something like a big storm that pushed her to make that move. And we're having increasingly large hurricane seasons, long duration hurricane seasons with bigger storms every time. It seems pretty likely that those extreme weather events are gonna have a, an even more pronounced effect on population distribution. But we'll start with, with a, a very charismatic focal species for us, at least here at Vins, uh, the snowy owl. Uh, they go by a couple of different names. Bubo scandiacus is their uh, scientific name. Bujo nival is the um, Spanish name for them. And Arfang de Neige is the French name for this bird. This is our very own LaGuardia, the male snowy owl that's on exhibit here at Vins. So under the, uh, the limited global warming that was part of the Paris Agreement of the 1.5 degrees C of warming, we'll see uh, through these studies done by the Audubon Society that over the next 30 to 50 years, the snowy owls will lose 19% of their winter range and more than half of their summer range. So this is a bird that does move back and forth between habitats during the seasons and their winter range, they they tend to come down here to us. Have any of you been lucky enough to see a snowy owl in the wild down here? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool experience. Uh, that's probably going to be a rarer and rarer event, especially as in the summertime when these birds are nesting high up in the Arctic, up in Nunavut and, and uh, uh, Northwest Territories, north of the Arctic Circle. More than half of their range is predicted to be gone in the next 30 to 50 years. They won't be able to inhabit that area because it won't be able to support them anymore. Oh, yeah, thank you, Sarah. So what is that gonna look like? Well, we always associate these owls, right? They're snowy owls, they're pure white, it's the driven snow because they hang out in the Arctic all the time, right? That's their camouflage. But if there's no snow, they kind of stick out like a sore thumb. And this happens to them anyway, right? In the summertime, in the Arctic, it's not like there's snow on the ground all the time. But when there's snow on the ground none of the time, suddenly their camouflage is not gonna work out so well for them. But it's not like they can just change to becoming a different color because those white feathers have another purpose. Living this far north in the Arctic, they don't get a lot of sunlight. And we know we all need sunlight to produce vitamin D in our skin. And those white feathers allow the vitamin D to get through the feathers to the skin, allow those sun rays uh, to help them produce this, this vital nutrient. And if they have to grow darker feathers, they won't be able to do that, even though the amount of sunlight in the Arctic isn't changing for them. We might also see them simply overheat. Snowy owls are very, very sensitive to temperature. And this guy sitting right here, he's sitting with his mouth open. Uh, birds can't sweat. We're very lucky as humans. We're one of the only animals that can sweat to cool ourselves off, but they have to pant to cool down and do uh, water exchange over that membrane in their mouth. So they might simply not be able to inhabit certain places because they're just too hot to live there. We might see them start congregating in certain areas where there's an abundance of food. So this is just a photo of uh, several juvenile snowy owls and probably mom or dad hanging out, uh, uh, offering food to them. Uh, near this coastal range, there's even another one in the background. Look at that, I didn't even notice. That's, that's probably mom and dad, and these are the juveniles, to be honest. But um, in, in these places, they're going to be congregating around food sources, and that makes them really vulnerable to a lot of different things, to predation, for one, for other animals coming and eating them, and also to disease. If one of these owls has avian influenza, all of them now have avian influenza because they're in such close proximity to each other because they have to be. And we also uh, see, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the things that we don't know yet about birds uh, and a lot of the, the personality that comes through. Any of us who know uh, Snowy, the female Snowy Owl, who's on exhibit very well, know that this is a perfect illustration of her personality. Um, this is an Inuit carving of a Snowy Owl. And the cultural significance of these owls to the Inuit people of Northern Canada 
um, is, is so deep and so running through their culture that losing the snowy owl from that, the range where they coexist is a cultural loss to those people as well. And those of us that enjoy seeing snowy owls when they come down for their winter migrations to places like Grand Isle or Plum Island uh, off the coast of Boston are, are going to miss out on that if they're not coming down here uh, anymore along our beaches. So the next bird we're going to focus on is a little bit different. It's also a migratory bird, but does a completely different kind of migration, the hermit thrush. Does anyone know what's special about the hermit thrush in Vermont? It's our state bird. Yeah, the state bird of Vermont is Catharis guttatus, the hermit thrush, and they're really beautiful. And I think, will that, nope, I have to poke it on the computer, but this is what they sound like. No. Oh, dear. Well, we'll have to play with it later then, because they have a beautiful, beautiful song. Um, hermit thrushes are found here in the summer in Vermont, but they migrate south to Central America and northern parts of South America. Uh, during the winter. Their summer range uh, under the conditions of only, again, only one and a half degrees C of warming, we're going to lose a significant portion of that. Oh, we've got, we've got a hermit thrush there. Go for it. Sorry. like a piano just oh I love it I, I'll never get tired of listening to that so under those conditions we can expect the hermit thrush in general to lose about a third of its summer range um, including nearly all of its range here in Vermont this is our state bird and it could be potentially that all of that red is range loss it could be potentially in only isolated pockets of the Green Mountains any any longer so what does that look like for a hermit thrush well there's a bunch of little hermit thrush babies in the nest, and they're very dependent on insect populations when, when they're that young. The mom and dad are going out and finding them caterpillars and crickets and spiders to eat and bringing them back to the nest. And if that timing doesn't match when they decide is a good time to lay eggs and when those eggs hatch, if there are not enough insects that have also emerged from their own hibernations at that same time, then those babies are not going to survive. Potentially, the hermit thrush family would re-nest. A lot of birds do this if they have an early nest failure. Maybe the eggs don't hatch. We'll just build another nest and lay more eggs. But there's a limited amount of time in the summer. And now you're late and delayed behind all of the other species of thrushes, our, our robins, our swains and thrushes, the bluebirds that are also dependent on the same set of insects. And it becomes this kind of negative feedback loop. Uh, they also, when they're adults, they eat a lot of fruit. And the timing of these... Uh, Fruits emerging on plants could become mismatched as plants make their own decisions about when to put resources into becoming a flower, becoming a fruiting body. Um, and for hundreds of thousands of years, hermit thrushes have relied on a specific timeline for these sorts of things to fuel up for migration, to make that thousand mile trek to South America. You need a lot of calories. And so you need to be to, to know that you're going to get enough food before that happens. If you decide not to migrate, to wait a little too long, perhaps into November or December because it's still warm and there's still fruit around, these extreme weather events can hit us, can happen, and a hermit thrush might get caught in a snowstorm up here without any food to eat and now can't finish that migration because they didn't start early enough. I actually had this happen. Our local hermit thrush um, who nests next to my garage every year came back the day of that gigantic snowstorm that we had most recently, like three weeks ago in April. I looked out my driveway at the 28 inches of snow that I had and this little hermit thrush bobbing around in my driveway, like, oh, I'm so sorry, man. <laughs> Bad timing. And that beautiful noise that we just listened to. There's a lot of uh, studies being done about bioacoustics and how um, birds communicate with sound with each other, and how those sounds are affected and that communication is affected by human noise and noise pollution as well um, and we risk losing that sound in our forests in the summertime that beautiful flute-like uh, waterfall of a sound that we don't we, we still need to learn from might not be there anymore 
And finally, the last species we're going to focus on is another uh, uh, kind of quintessential New England bird, the common loon. Uh, loons, and Sarah's going to pull up a good loon call for us. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, loons are really, really um, important and, and fascinating species up here. And there's a lot of work being done on loon conservation in Vermont and New Hampshire. And in fact, one of our staff in the rehabilitation clinic here uh, takes part in a bunch of different studies about loon mortality in New Hampshire, the things, the things that kill adult loons and how can we um, prevent those things from happening because it's not a natural thing, right? It's all, it's all human caused mortality. So you got it? In the Adirondacks, um, I think the big problem up there are the eagles getting the babies off their back. Yeah, that can happen too. Yeah. That's a big, um, big mm -hmm. problem Yeah. I differentiated, I said uh, uh, also adult mortality, what's killing the adults, because a lot of the time the, the babies are incredibly vulnerable. And like, that's just their, their thing. Their parents are extremely protective of them because there's so many things that can eat them. So there's a certain expected level of babies that will die in a given season. But that level is much, much lower for the fully grown adult loon. And the things that we see that are killing loons are killing the adults rather than the babies. So. Here's a loon. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing like just hiking along a pond in the fog and hearing that just out of nowhere. That can't be sleeping at night and hearing. Yeah. Oh, it's so wonderful. We love loons here. So loons, again, under this the 1.5 degrees C of warming that's been part of the Paris Climate Agreement, they'll uh, expected to lose about 12% of their summer range uh, from here in North America. And that includes a large portion of their range in Vermont. So here's the, the outline of our state right there. So it's, it's um, absolutely not everything here, but all of the red is would be range loss for the loon. And, and then all of the orange is... Should we fail to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial level, should it become two degrees, or God forbid, three degrees, then they lose the orange and the yellow parts of their range as well. So what does this look like to a loon? Well, there's a loon panting, right? They're not all that uh, tolerant of really, really hot temperatures either. Fortunately, they hang out near water. They've got a lot of opportunities to stay cool. Um, this guy can just pop right into the pond to cool off a little bit. But what about the eggs that she's sitting on? And what about the babies in the nest that don't have that opportunity? So heat is just as much of a problem for these guys um, as it is for the snowies. There's the little babies, right? Very, very protective mom and dad of those little babies. They typically don't have too many of them, two or three at most. Um, is typical for a breeding season. So they're, they're not reproducing very fast. Any loss of the adult population is not going to be rapidly replaced by the amount of young that are coming in. So that's an important thing too. Uh, but while we're talking about like food provisioning and the, the food that they need to raise their young, if there's not sufficient fish in that lake because there's something wrong with the timing of the fish coming out of their brumation and reproducing and uh, those cycles uh, of nutrients within the pond, that will also affect how much the babies are able to eat to be able to grow up big and strong and become adult loons and make their own migrations as well. The problem uh, about migration for loons is a really, really dire one because I don't know if you've ever seen a loon try to walk on land. They really can't. They really, really can't. They're so efficiently built as divers that their feet are all the way at the back of their body. And so in order to get up on land and walk around, they fall over on their chest. They really can't. When we, we talk about them as beached loons, when a loon is out of the water, they're almost completely powerless. They also have long, thin wings that help them to navigate while they're diving and, and fly really quickly for their migration, but they need a long runway to get up and out of the water. They can't just take off into the air. So with our warmer temperatures, if an individual, a juvenile loon like this guy decides, you know, what, I'm not going to migrate this year. It's November. It's pretty warm. The lake is still open. There's still fish. I'm going to stay. And then we have a cold snap. Then the loon is frozen into the ice and can no longer leave. 
fortunately, sometimes there are people that can go out and help. <laughs> Some people go out and rescue this poor loon that was stuck in the ice. But it's becoming a more and more frequent uh, problem, uh, especially up here where we do get those kind of strange cold snaps and warm spells that loons, as many birds who migrate, they make the decision whether or not to migrate uh, day to day. Maybe I'll, mig maybe I'll leave today, maybe I'll wait until tomorrow. And with our warming climate up here and our warmer, wetter winters that we're experiencing, an increasing number of loons are saying to themselves, it's not worth migrating right now, I'm going to stay. And then they get stuck. But another problem uh, that, uh, again, our staff here at VINS are working on is the spread of diseases among these birds. With warmer, wetter temperatures come the spread of different viruses and bacteria, uh, mostly through the insects that can transmit them. And so loons are actually experiencing an epidemic of malaria, of all things. Uh, avian malaria, specifically, it's not transmissible as malaria to humans, but they get it from mosquitoes, and it's fatal. And we're seeing a lot of adult loons contract malaria and die because they're being bitten by mosquitoes that would not have previously been able to survive up here uh, without these conditions of a warmer, wetter climate. So we, every loon that we get into our rehabilitation clinic, we test them for malaria uh, just to see if they have it, even at a low level, so we can get a good map of where it is within the population. And it's absolutely everywhere. Yeah. So what do we do? <laughs> that was a lot, right? Pretty heavy stuff. I'm not denying that this is super heavy stuff. Um, and I've, uh, over the years here as an educator at VINS, been tasked with talking to um, many different groups of people about climate change. And it's, it's never easy because it feels like such an enormous problem that's beyond each individual of us. Um, but I always say that that's kind of the point. It's not up to one person. It's up to a whole community of people to figure out how are we going to cope with this. And so we're going to go through what is already being done and what are some more things that each of us can, with our own skills and passions, choose to contribute our, our time to. So whoop, there's a lot of different things. You hear, it, you hear it all over the place. All the different things that you can do to reduce uh, our impact on our climate, from drive less, fly less, use more efficient light bulbs, public transportation, walk, eat locally, eat less meat, blah, 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 blah. All of this comes down to reduce carbon emissions. That is the one thing that we need to do. Those items all contribute to reducing carbon emissions, but as soon as we get down to that's the crux of the issue, that is the only thing that we have to do. That's just one thing. Pretty easy, right? <laughs> So Project Drawdown is a great um, uh, a NGO. There's an organization, kind of a think tank of scientists from around the world who are working on this concept of drawdown, not only to stop producing new uh, fossil fuel and carbon dioxide emissions, but to draw down to take those industries offline and replace them with other non-emitting industries to take a, a certain amount of carbon out of the atmosphere to bring us back down, hopefully, below 400 parts per million over the next couple of years. Um, so they recommend uh, several different actions. This is a big, big wheel of the 80 different solutions that Project Drawdown calls out as these are the most important things that you can do. Um, so we're going to focus on kind of the top five of those. So wind and solar, switching our electrical grid from a fossil fuel-based grid to one of renewable energy sources, primarily wind and solar, is kind of the biggest thing that we're working on now um, to reduce those carbon emissions. And currently, Vermont has five utility-scale wind farms, which is pretty good. Could be better. It's pretty good. Uh, and together with solar farms, they produce about 27% uh, of the in-state electricity generation, which is abysmal. Like 27%, that's it, really? Um, we, Vermont is very, very good about um, not producing using coal. A lot of our electricity, the, basically the other 73% is hydroelectric power that we buy from Quebec. So that is also non-emitting. Uh, dams have their own issues, but we can, we can certainly do better and be a, be a better model for uh, the rest of the United States on, on how to do wind and solar well. But what else can we do? We can voice support for new wind and solar projects when they come up. Um, 
Sometimes we have a, a little bit of NIMBY here, especially in Vermont, the not in my backyard sentiment. Like, yeah, that's fine, but don't put the wind farm in my personal backyard, my space. Um, but that's not okay, because then it just gets put in someone else's backyard. So we have to be supportive of these new projects as they come in and, and try to be uh, helpful. And, and also, uh, you know, speak up and, and discerning. If we think that maybe don't put the solar panels over the you know, wetland with the endangered species of ferns in it, maybe move it over 100 yards, but, you know, don't lose that support for the project as a whole. Uh, you can put solar panels on your own roof. That's always fun, because if you produce enough solar, then the electric company has to pay you. Green Mountain Power uh, is our main electric company here in Vermont. They've not been the best about this, as I'm sure you can imagine, because they don't want to pay the people who had been paying them. But if there is enough momentum behind it, as uh, solar CSAs have begun to do, then that is how um, change can get made. Join a solar CSA. These are a group of, uh, a group of homes, homeowners within a neighborhood who've decided, you know what, we all are going to go solar together. We're going to you know, have this little piece of land that's communal to all of us and all go into purchasing the solar arrays and then all use the electricity off of it. And if you move into the area and you want to join the CSA, the Community Supported Agriculture, you can just hook into their electrical grid as well. So there's a number of different uh, uh, communities like that across Vermont that are doing that and, and even more every day. And we can also help fund the installation of wind farms and solar arrays. They're, it's non-trivial. They are kind of expensive to put in, but there are ways to um, contract with the community to get these things going. Uh, we have several solar panels right here on site at VINS. They generate about a third of VINS's electricity. Um, we don't actually own those solar panels. We did not put a penny into their installation. It was a group of corporations that wanted to put solar panels in and be able to use some of that electricity. We have the opportunity after 15 years to buy the solar panels from them, um, but it was a, a really great kind of uh, agreement that they got the land on which to place those panels, they get the electricity, and we get the opportunity to own the panels uh, at a future time. And we can also create incentives for utilities to use distributed solar. That's the solar on people's roofs. As I said, currently Green Mountain Power is in that stage of trying to grasp at the thing they're about to lose, which is customers who pay for their electricity, but legislation will help to create incentives for them to want to help people put solar panels on their roofs and help install the infrastructure necessary to make this change. The next thing is to uh, consume a plant-rich diet and reduce your food waste. Um, we tend to think of food uh, as kind of a more I don't know, like land use based uh, conservation action, but it really is closely related to climate change. And the reason is there's so, so much carbon dioxide emitted from the production of food, especially meat food, that just by switching to a more plant based diet, you can greatly reduce your own personal responsibility for carbon emissions. Uh, so Vermont now, um, for a couple of years now, we've had the universal recycling law which uh, requires food scraps to be put in the compost to be reused as uh, fertile soil to be growing new plants. So it's been required for restaurants, I think, for a number of years before then. Uh, but now we must compost all of our food scraps so that they get back to the land. Well, what else can we do? We can reduce consumption of meat and dairy. Uh, this is hard, I know, especially for my husband, who is a self-described carnivore. Right? He wants, he wants his hamburger. And that's fine. Every once in a while, I'm like, you know what? You get a hamburger. I'm going to get a veggie burger. And then he wants to try my veggie burger. And then he's like, actually, that was okay. It was pretty good. Um, you don't have to go completely vegan overnight. No one's, no one's asking anyone to do that. It's a, our own personal choices are, are for ourselves. But if you think you can maybe do without that you know, entire 20 ounce steak once a month. That's a step in the right direction. We can compost our food waste to make sure that the uh, plant matter that we're eating goes back into the environment, doesn't get thrown away, never to be used again. All that nitrogen goes back into the soil. 
Creating meal plans is another one that uh, I have struggled with, but I'm trying to do better. And this is all about reducing food waste to plan what kind of food you're going to use for what purpose ahead of time. So you don't end up with a bunch of unused stuff in your fridge at the end of the week that you have to throw away or compost. A lot of energy went into producing that food that you bought and didn't eat, and that's wasted energy. Buy what you need, similar thing. And then end subsidies for meat production. All, all of this is, is useless if it's still more expensive to buy organic produce than it is to buy meat in the grocery store. And that's because of subsidies that are provided to meat farmers, right? To keep meat cheap so people can buy it, but if those were gone, that would be less spending that the government had to put into that particular program and more incentive to eat a plant-based diet. Uh, and also, again, by that token, make plant-based options more affordable. Things like that veggie burger that helps to transition someone who's used to eating a hamburger onto a veggie burger. Those plant-based options should be less expensive than the meat option. Uh, make it a lot easier for people of diverse socioeconomic status to make those choices as well. And finally, improve the storage and processing of foods. And this actually ties into the next thing uh, that we're going to talk about as well. But this is all about reducing the waste, reducing the, um, the amount of stuff that you have to throw away, that the grocery store has to throw away at the end of the week because it went bad while we were storing it. Now, the, the third of the, our five actions that we're talking about today is refrigerant management. This gets really nerdy and esoteric. Um, so the Vermont House Committee on Energy and Technology uh, recently enacted legislation that prohibits HFCs uh, from specific refrigerators, which is really great. HFCs, like, are used in, in refrigerators um, are much, much worse, like something that's 300 to 800 times worse of a greenhouse gas than methane which is a terrible greenhouse gas. So an old refrigerator that's full of this coolant is just sitting there leaking greenhouse gases that are 300 times more potent into the atmosphere than driving your car around. Now, uh, most modern refrigerators do not use HFCs. The big transition uh, that needs to happen is grocery stores still use a lot of large amounts of this refrigerant. Um, so fortunately, there's things we can do about it. We can use those HFC-free appliances. Um, many of us might be familiar with CFCs, which are, is a similar uh, molecule that was uh, regulated a long, long time ago, but HFCs are still in our environment. We can shop in HFC-free supermarkets, and there is, I believe, there's a website that's updated uh, continuously about specific supermarkets that are in your area that don't use HFCs in their refrigerants. Um, and I think the Shaw's in West Lebanon is the one that's closest to us. So, so good on them. But if we patronize those stores and say, hey, you know, I'm choosing to shop here because of this specific reason and let uh, the managers of those supermarkets know that that's the reason, that's how we're going to push them to make a change. Uh, Climatefriendlysupermarkets.org, that is the website. Dispose of HFC appliances properly. I drive by uh, a house on my way to work every single day, and there's an old refrigerator sitting on the front lawn. <laughs> One of these days, I'm gonna go knock on their door and say, hey, hey, can you maybe do something about that? Uh, there are uh, companies throughout the United States that will, you, all you have to do is call them, and they will come and pick up your old refrigerator, your old barrel of coolant. Uh, and dispose of it properly. Uh, and sometimes they'll even pay you to take it because they can recycle the materials that are associated with it. And we can advocate for the ban of production of new appliances that use HFCs within them and just do away with this problem entirely. Forest restoration is the fourth of these actions, which is very near and dear to our hearts here in Vermont, of course. Um, uh, our state is about 75% forested, and New Hampshire is a little bit more. I think they're closer to 80% covered in forests. So Vermonters, I, I think we already do a pretty good job of helping to minimize uh, forestry pressure. And uh, there's, there's certainly very, very limited, if any, clear cutting that goes on in Vermont. Uh, forests are managed with climate and species biodiversity in mind here, with specific timing of the seasons of when to harvest lumber. Uh, so uh, those are all things that are helpful in terms of how do we rebuild forests 
in other areas and maintain them in a way that they are economically productive for the people who are living there, but also productive in terms of carbon sinks for um, dealing with climate change. Shade grown coffee is another thing that, that falls into this category. Coffee is one of our favorite products to consume and it can be grown in the shade. It can be grown under a canopy of trees. Uh, it doesn't need to be on a clear cut plantation. So uh, having looking for that little label on your coffee that says this is grown in the shade, that's a huge way to vote with your dollars about this sort of stuff. So what else can we do? We can uh, provide our support for land protections, voice support for protecting uh, ex uh, expanses of land. Here in Vermont, the Nature Conservancy and the Vermont Land Trust do a really good job of that. Uh, we can encourage entrepreneurs towards sustainable forest income, people that live here, but also people living uh, in other countries who make their living off of forest ecosystems right now. We can help teach them these sustainable practices that we've learned over decades up here and, and give them a chance to continue to use the forest for income for many, many decades to come. We can also incentivize sustainable forestry practices at home and overseas, so providing those putting those laws in place uh, and uh, working with NGOs to promote uh, sustainable forestry practices. Oh, and that was all I had about that one. <laughs> so the very last uh, thing that's also near and dear to our hearts here at Vins is health and education, is educating people. Having conversations about all of this stuff with other people is huge because I think most people in their hearts, they, they sort of know peripherally about this is a problem and they know that they want to help, but they don't know what to do. They don't have one action that they can take. Um, and also educating people about uh, the, the like power that they have, essentially, to make choices and to make decisions in the world. So uh, education and access to health care, especially for women and girls, is really, really important. Uh, empowering them to uh, make decisions about their household and make decisions about their income. Uh, and an individual can discuss climate change and environmental issues with uh, other organizations and support organizations that are providing this education. As a community, we can make healthcare and education access a basic universal right to everyone within the community, just like our other unalienable rights. It seems pretty obvious to me that access to information should be uh, a guarantee for everyone. So those are the kind of main five things that Project Drawdown and many scientists working on climate change advocate. These are our focal areas that we need to be working on. And the reason for it, and I hope this video will play, as we know, we're all here because we love birds. Uh, do you guys know about a starling murmuration? Mm, yeah. Murmurations are a, a type of flight that is done by um, mostly prey animals. This is a type of flight that starlings and other small birds do, uh, especially when they are being preyed on by something like a peregrine falcon. They sort of act like a fishball in the ocean. And it's sort of unimaginably gorgeous. We don't really know a lot about how they achieve this type of motion all moving together. This is a couple of hundred thousand birds all moving together. And so we know from the three billion birds study that we saw earlier that that it's even some of our most common bird species that are being lost. Something like several hundred thousand starlings in a murmuration like that. And starlings. Little more than a hundred years ago, there was, yeah, another species of bird in North America called the passenger pigeon that numbered somewhere in the five billion birds in, that, in the passenger pigeon flocks. Um, there was reports of one one flock that took three hours to pass over a specific spot. There were so many birds in it, and it absolutely blackened the sky. That's something we can't imagine today. That's something that just doesn't, just doesn't work in our minds. But it was real, and it did happen. 
and this is real, and this does happen all the time. So this is what, this is at least my reason for caring about climate change and what we're going to do to help. Beautiful video. I'm sorry it didn't show on my thing. All right, I think, actually, that brings us to my summary here. Basically, this, this presentation, and, and you guys are right on time for the two o'clock program. We talked a little bit about how human actions are causing, oh, yeah, it's playing another video. What a great presentation, Sarah, thank you. <laughs> human actions are causing climate change. We know that, we know, we know why. Birds provide a vital ecosystem service for us. Climate change will harm these bird populations. And so we have the responsibility, but we also have the means to reverse this trend that's going on. And with that, that is the end of my climate change and birds presentation. Thank you so much.